What is going on guys? I'm very, very excited about this video because I finally get to talk to you about one of my favorite AWS services, AWS CloudFormation. And the reason that I wanted to make this video is not only because I love AWS CloudFormation, but because I think it is such an important skill right now, especially in the software industry, but it could be kind of intimidating to learn. Uh, so what I wanted to do in this video is just kind of give you a very simple understanding of what CloudFormation is. So in terms of what to expect, we're first gonna talk about what is CloudFormation. And I'm gonna explain it to you with a very simple example. Second, we're gonna talk about the key CloudFormation concepts. From there, we're gonna talk about the pros and cons of using CloudFormation. And then from there, we're gonna talk about how it compares to some other popular infrastructure as code solutions, such as Terraform, Serverless Framework, AWS SAM, also known as Serverless Application Model, and AWS CDK, which is Cloud Development Kit. And then finally, I'm gonna to talk to you about how to get started learning CloudFormation for your next project. So first of all, let's explain what CloudFormation is through a very, very simple example. So let's say you're just getting started on AWS and you go ahead on US East One, you're in the AWS console, you wanna build a REST API and you're gonna use API Gateway combined with a Lambda function because it's super, super easy to build REST APIs. And by the way, I have a whole video on this and I think I have one where you can set this up in eight clicks or something like that. I'll put that in the description. So you're having a good time in the AWS console, you're doing all this stuff, manually, you decide, hey, I need a database, I need my DynamoDB table, so you go ahead and create that. And then you decide later, hey, I also need an S3 bucket to store some of my log data or some other metadata about my app. You go ahead and create that. Then you're like, hey, I need some roles that go along with my Lambda function now to access this stuff. Okay, then I want AWS Athena to perform analytics. I wanna create some users for my business users to access Athena then they got to get logins and passwords. Then you got to get permissions to them as well. And you can see this is getting very, very difficult to manage just in this very simple example. And then what's worse after that? Well, your boss comes to you and says, hey, Dan, your application is doing really well. We want to move it over to EU West 1 because we want to serve our European customers too. And then you got to do this. And you got to do this all through the console. And you better hope you remembered the name of every resource you created and all the permissions that you added. And you better hope that you didn't forget anything because then all this isn't going to work. And you just feel like this guy. This isn't a good feeling to have to kind of copy paste all this stuff. So no one wants to feel like this guy. No one wants to look this sad, this upset, this frustrated. So there must be a better way. What is the better way? And this is where CloudFormation comes in. So wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't it be nice, instead of going into the console and clicking a thousand buttons and creating all these things and having to manage them and remember them, that we can instead write a document, write a file, a template file that defines how each of these things are created, how they are constructed, every connection between them, all the permissions, and have that all written as code. And wouldn't it be nice if we can upload that to AWS and say, AWS, can you go ahead and deploy this file and create your API gateway, create your Lambda function, create your roles, create your DynamoDB table, your S3 bucket, your Athena databases, your users, your everything. Wouldn't it be nice if we can just upload a simple file to somewhere and get AWS to do this? Well, this is what AWS CloudFormation is. It is an infrastructure as code provider that allows you to do just what I demonstrated. It allows you to create and define a file and then upload that to AWS CloudFormation, which is this guy here. And AWS CloudFormation through a single click will take that file and go and deploy every single thing in this diagram for you and then give you status updates on the way to say, yeah, this is done, that's done, that's done. And then, oops, what if something goes wrong? Maybe your Lambda function's having a problem. It'll automatically roll back for you. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, that's exactly what AWS CloudFormation is, and that's why it's so awesome. It's so easy to use. All you do is define your template files, you upload them. There's a couple of different means to upload them, which we'll get to in a second. It's great for regional expansion, so if you wanna move all this stuff to a different region, if your business is 
quickly growing, then it's great for that. It's got a whole bunch of other benefits, but this is the main idea. You write a template file, you upload that to CloudFormation in this case, and that is responsible for creating all of this different stuff here. That is what CloudFormation is in a nutshell. So let's move on to the key concepts of CloudFormation now. Uh, so the first one is that you create these uh, template files that are in either YAML or JSON. Now, for whatever reason, YAML has really taken off. I don't know why you would expect that everyone would use JSON, but it seems like the community has decided that YAML is the way to go. And I've been doing this for a while, and I gotta say, it looks pretty clean when you use YAML compared to JSON, so I'm all for that. But anyways, you define these templates, and these template files contain resources, and the resources are essentially all the AWS things that you wanna create. Your you know, S3 buckets, your S SQS queues, your IAM roles, your users, everything that goes with it. Uh, so that is the first concept. So what do these templates even look like? Well, this is a example of a Lambda function in a YAML format. So what are we looking at here? Well, this is the name of your resource and the type of your resource is a Lambda function. And then you're defining some properties on that Lambda function. And you're saying the handler's uh, input file is the index.handler. You're saying it has a role called this guy. And this example is actually doing something fairly interesting. Typically what you would do with the Lambda function is in the code section here, you would give it a zip file that's located in S3. But what they're doing here is actually kind of interesting. It's, it's a little bit of a shortcut. So they're using substitution to do some inline JavaScript. So all of this JavaScript down here, this is going to be the definition of your Lambda function. And then finally, it lets you specify the runtime of it. Now, this is how you would define, in this case, a Lambda function, but it's the same format for every other AWS resource. You just specify the type. If you want an SQS queue, you put that here. If you want an S3 bucket, you put that here. There's recipes that you can follow, and this stuff is very, very well documented. Uh, so that is the first concept. You kind of define these YAML or JSON files that are called templates, and they contain AWS resources. Uh, so the second key concept is something called stacks. And these are the things that are the logical groupings of your templates and their resources. So maybe you would set this up on an application level. So every application has a different stack. You can combine multiple template files together. So you can kind of sum them up and deploy them all at once with the same stack. Uh, you can also create something called nested stacks where you can have kind of graph-like relationships between your stacks if you want to deploy something a little bit more complex. Uh, but that's stacks. And the third main concept to know about is something called change sets. And what change sets are, are basically a diff between what CloudFormation has from your previous upload and what you are attempting to upload. So they are the diff between those two things, similar to what you would see on Git, if you have a diff between two Git commits. Uh, so what change sets basically do is show you a preview of what CloudFormation is gonna do in its incremental update. So CloudFormation always updates incrementally. It always looks at what has changed since your last upload and only performs updates on things that have changed. So that's how CloudFormation works. It works in incremental steps. Uh, so those are the key concepts. Now let's talk about some of the pros and cons of CloudFormation. Uh, so in terms of the pros, I kind of mentioned a lot of them here, but it makes your life just a whole lot easier. It's very simple and quick to whip together some recipes that can do some pretty complicated things. Like I said, it's also great for regional expansion. So you can very, very quickly deploy this out to multiple different regions with just a couple clicks. Uh, second, it allows you to introduce code review mechanisms for infrastructure changes. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people accidentally fat finger something and delete either a queue, a database, a bucket, a file, something on AWS, and you just think, why? Why did you do this to yourself? Um, so using infrastructure as code and CloudFormation in particular, you can add an additional layer of verification to your infrastructure change process through code reviews. So instead of someone just going in there and making changes directly in the console without anyone knowing, uh, you can kind of release your infrastructure updates through a change management process that is backed by code reviews. Uh, the third main pro is that you can very easily integrate this with the CI pipeline. CI stands for continuous integration. Uh, so you can attach your YAML or JSON template files to things like GitHub hooks. And based on changes to your files, it'll automatically trigger a pipeline in AWS through code pipeline and deploy all your changes through CloudFormation. Uh, so it's very, very quick and easy to get started with this and introduce a full CI pipeline for your infrastructure changes. 
Fourth, it's got a huge community support. CloudFormation has been around for many years. Uh, it's not a new service by any means. So there's tons of Stack Overflow help, tons of community volunteers that'll help you kind of work through some of your problems. So you're not alone if you face some issues with CloudFormation. Uh, now, in terms of the cons, every great thing has its set of weaknesses and CloudFormation is no different. Uh, so the first con is that it's a little bit of a steep learning curve. And I would say that this is less true more recently because like I said, it's got a large community support and there's tons of examples out there, but it's just a little bit difficult getting started because there's a lot of concepts at play and a lot of different recipes and things that can go wrong that can impact you. Uh, so I would say it's got a steep learning curve, but once you learn the main concept, this stuff is cake like it's very very easy to understand um, the second main con is that I learned this the hard way which is that innocent looking changes can be dangerous and what I mean by this is that uh, in my particular case if you change the name of a resource such as a DynamoDB table or a database instance or whatever changing the name will cause CloudFormation to delete that thing and spin up a new one and when it deletes it there goes all your data uh, so you got to understand the nuances of CloudFormation because unfortunately these things do exist and it can't come to bite you. So you just kind of need to be aware of them before you get started. Um, and the third one is there's this concept of drift and it can be painful if you're not aware of it. And drift is this concept that CloudFormation keeps a snapshot of what it thinks the state of your AWS account is and all the resources that are tied to your CloudFormation stack. And it kind of persists this snapshot and that snapshot typically only changes when you perform an update through a change set through that process that I spoke to you before about. However, if you come you know, through your AWS console or through your AWS CLI and you make a modification directly to some of the resources that your CloudFormation stack is in charge of maintaining, then that causes drift, which is an out of sync issue where CloudFormation thinks that your resource is set up in this way, but in fact on AWS, it is set up in a different way. So what I'm trying to say here is that when you start using CloudFormation to manage your resources, you kind of need to treat your AWS account as read only. You shouldn't be making manual changes in your account anymore. That'll cause a concept called drift and it can actually cause your deployments to fail on CloudFormation. Uh, so be aware of drift. It's I label it as a con, but maybe it's just kind of a negative feature about CloudFormation. So we talked about what's good and what's bad. Now let's talk about uh, kind of how does it compare to some other popular infrastructure as code solutions. Uh, so the first one that I want to talk about is AWS SAM, stands for Serverless Application Management. And under the hood, SAM actually uses CloudFormation. It's great for setting up, like it says, serverless applications, so Lambdas, API gateways. It really helps you build serverless applications very quickly. Now on the other side of that coin is the serverless framework, which I would say is pretty much a direct competitor to AWS SAM. Uh, but interestingly, serverless also uses CloudFormation under the hood, but it uses kind of a wrapper language on top of it uh, that you need to use. But it looks very, very similar to what CloudFormation looks like. Uh, so these are very, very similar SAM and serverless. There's not too much differences between them, but you know, one is supported and built by AWS, one is not. So take that uh, as your deciding factor, perhaps. Uh, now, the next popular one is Terraform. And what Terraform is great at is um, if you have a kind of mix and match scenario where some of your infrastructure may be on Azure, some of it may be on AWS, some of it may be elsewhere in another cloud provider, Terraform is a great wrapper on top of cloud infrastructure concepts, which allows you to be provider agnostic. A lot of people like to say that Terraform is more dedicated to infrastructure. I don't think I would necessarily agree with that, but that's kind of what the community has decided. Uh, and then finally, there's AWS Cloud Development Kit. And this is kind of a newer offering from AWS. And CDK allows you to write actual JavaScript or TypeScript or some other languages as well and declare your infrastructure as code in your template files as opposed to using this JSON or YAML notation. Uh, so it allows you to use constructs like if statements, for loops, all that kind of stuff that you would expect in a standard programming language. And because of that, it allows you to do some very interesting and flexible things. Uh, so this is kind of the newer, hotter, thing to learn right now, Cloud Development Kit. Now, another thing that I wanted to point out was that all of these, SAM, Serverless, Terraform, and CDK, all compile down to CloudFormation to deploy to AWS. So regardless of which one of these things that you choose, if you're ever facing problems with any of these frameworks, 
you're probably going to need to know how CloudFormation works to debug the problem. Uh, so it's a very good starting point, very good foundational skill to learn because it's going to be present in all of these different uh, frameworks. And actually, some of the notation is almost identical to what you would see in a CloudFormation template file in YAML. Now, if you're just getting started, I would suggest to probably learn SAM first. And the reason I say this is because if you're trying to get started through the console, it's not a very good process in terms of development cycles. Uh, you kind of got to upload a new template file every time you make a change, try it out, see if it fails, you know, make a change again, upload it, try it out, yada, yada, yada. Now, if you're using SAM, it comes with a handy CLI tool. In fact, these all do. So maybe this applies to all these different ones. But I, I learned on SAM. I think it's straightforward. But anyways, because you're using a CLI tool to update your CloudFormation stack, you have very, very quick cycles because you just define your CloudFormation file locally. So it allows you to test things out, kind of just get your feet wet and experiment a little bit. Uh, so I would definitely use SAM when you're getting started. In terms of like, mechanically what should you do to get started install sam read some of the documentation on aws cloud formation and just get started with something basic like a lambda function and maybe like an s3 bucket just get your feet wet and just create some stuff like anything you learn by doing and cloud formation is no exception so i'm going to be coming out with a follow-up video to this which is kind of getting started with sam and getting started with cloud formation to develop serverless applications so i'll put that in the description section when it is available and if you like this video be sure to check out my channel I have a whole bunch of AWS and software engineering system design videos available on my channel. And as always, please don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.